Hello, and welcome to One on One with Robert Doerr. I'm your host, Robert Doerr, and thanks for tuning in today. As president of the American Enterprise Institute, I have the unique privilege of working with America's greatest policy experts. These scholars focus on policy issues in the fields of education, economics, energy, foreign and defense, and so much more. Subscribe to this podcast for exclusive access to in-depth discussions on the most pressing policy issues. Together with my guests, we'll challenge political preconceptions, explore innovative ideas, and create, I hope, a freer and safer world. Joining me today is Matthew Continetti, the director of the domestic policies here at AEI and a a very well-respected and and important public intellectual uh, here in Washington. has written a great book called The Right, which was the sort of history of the conservative movement in the United States. It's been done before, but never as well as done by Matt. And so, Matt, we're honored to have you and honored to have you at AEI. Uh, I wanted to start out with um, a thought I have in the wake of Thomas Suozzi's victory uh, in Long Island, um, beating the Republican candidate in a Republican-held district uh, that the Republicans had said they thought they were going to win. Uh, Swazi won a pretty big number. I mean, I think it was six or seven points. And I just wondered whether you want... We've been spending a lot of time talking about the Republican primary election, which seems to be pretty one-sided. But in a general election, is there a constituency that uh, might vote for Republicans, but but not for these Republicans? Sure. Well, first, Robert, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, an honor for me to work at AEI. I love this institution, and, and uh, I love coming to work here every day. There's a lot going on in American politics that leaves me befuddled, and one aspect is the split-screen quality to our politics. President Biden is extremely unpopular, and he's remained unpopular for years now. His approval rating went underwater in the summer of 2021. It is now winter 2024. Yet since 2021, since Glenn Youngkin's a surprise victory in the Virginia gubernatorial election that year, Republicans have underperformed and Democrats have overperformed, especially in special elections like the election under discussion in New York to fill the seat uh, vacated by George Santos when the House of Representatives expelled him last year. So this result, which pitted um, Tom Suozzi, who was a longtime Democratic politician who had held a congressional seat from Nassau County before, against Maisie Pillip, who was a very unusual candidate. She was an Ethiopian Jewish immigrant. Um, she was part of the Trump MAGA movement. She was uh, pro-life. That became an issue. And as you mentioned, Swazi really won a, a, a significant victory over Pillip in the special election. What lessons are we supposed to draw from this? Well, like I said, the chief lesson I usually draw is confusion because a, a few things are happening. One is the polls that undercounted Swazi's support in the district. He, he, that is to say, he won by a greater margin than the polls were showing. But the polls had him winning. The, poll, the same polls had Trump winning against Biden in the district. So does that mean we can extrapolate from the special election victory for the Democrats that the Democrats will outperform in November? Not necessarily. And one reason I'm hesitant to extrapolate is that the Democratic overperformance since 2021 is largely being driven by its new base constituency, which are affluent college degree holders living in the suburbs. And these are the voters who are precisely going to be the most engaged and the most likely to show up on a special election or to vote ahead in a special election. The day in which the election was held, there was a snowstorm. So you have to be really engaged in politics to want to go out into the snow and vote for uh, your candidate. And th those voters who are the most engaged tend to be Democrats. So that's why I'm a little bit leery of making any l broad generalizations about the result of this special election or, or any of, of the other special elections. In a general election, 
like the one we'll be holding in November. The turnout will be massive. It's always massive in a presidential year. It's been especially massive since the beginning of the Trump era. And the fact is that Trump's person, his very presence on the ballot, brings out voters who would not be bothered to vote in a special election if Trump is not somewhere on that ballot. And that, to me, is the real question. If Donald Trump is the Republican nominee, is will that same turnout effect, which works both ways, he brings out his supporters, but he also brings out people who can't stand him. Will that happen in November, and might it give Trump an advantage that is not visible in any of these special election results? Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I was in a meeting of uh, Republican House members uh, who were talking about – they were all from New York. And they were talking about the special election in Nassau County coming up. And they were – it was actually an argument about why they should – go ahead with expelling Santos. And they said very emphatically, Republicans on Nassau County always win special elections. Uh, And we've got a great chairman there. And this is going to be, it's it's in the bag for us. And there was a lot of news stories in the run up that, yes, Nassau County, Republicans had won race after race after race. And, um, And then to have and then you worried because there is this anger at Biden and this discontent. This was held the week after Biden's infamous press conference, which was a disaster. Uh, and immigration seems to be a hot issue in New York, as it, and Biden has to take the blame for that. Mm-hmm. And yet Swazi wins by six points. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I agree. With that. And then the other thing that was so remarkable about it to me was that, he, that the Republican candidate was the Republican candidate. She, you said that she came, she was MAGA. She was part of that world. World. Within five hours after the election, President Trump had put out a tweet totally disparaging her sure. and in, a, in an unpleasant and just totally un, ungrateful way. So I, I just wonder if there is a group of Americans who are just fed up with the chaos, as the other Republican candidate would say, mm-hmm. and are just not not voting for that team anymore until it gets its act together. Uh, We've seen uh, since 2016, the Republicans are not doing very well in the suburbs, which had been the basis of their massive majorities in the 70s and 80s. And even the Republican strength in the 2000s, it was all found in the suburbs, married white voters with children, uh, college degrees, upwardly mobile uh, professionals, that's no longer the Republican Party. And so the your colleagues who were talking about, well, we always win special elections in Nassau County, that might have been true 10 years ago. It's not lo- no longer true because the voters have changed. I do think it's important to recognize that Swazi, uh, when he was in Congress before, was known as something of a border hawk. So it was harder to make the immigration argument against him. In addition, What we've seen since the reversal of Roe v. Wade is that if the argument is between abortion rights and immigration, supporters of abortion rights will win. And that has that's been the case in several special elections now. What do you mean argument of abortion rights versus immigration? So if you so if the Republican candidate is saying, vote for me, control the border, and the Democratic candidate is saying, vote for me, I'm going to protect your right to an abortion. The side that says, I'm going to protect your right to an abortion has the advantage. Because when you think about the issues that actually move voters to go out and vote, immigration has a spotty track record. It's not like gun rights, and it's not like abortion rights. And before Roe v. Wade was overturned, the pro-life community was the one that was inspired to go out and vote. Since Roe v. Wade has been overturned, it's now supporters of abortion rights who are motivated to go out to make sure that they're protected. We saw this in places like uh, Chicago, where in the mayoral race, I mean, the mayor of Chicago has very little control over abortion policy in his city. And yet Brandon Johnson, the far left candidate, painted his challenger, George Vallis, as someone who had made pro-life statements in the past that really hurt Vallis in this context. So I think that's an important aspect of it. And then this broader trend of 
the Democrats having an advantage in special elections because of their highly educated, engaged voter base um, is another takeaway from this election. On the immigration being a spotty uh, player in politics, is it even more spotty or more cluttered because um, Republicans insisted on a really tough immigration uh, provisions in the Ukraine aid bill, got them, and then turned around and rejected them? Did, did that... Where were you on that? Well, I was I was looking at the legislation and I was analyzing it. <laughs> I won't say that voters really as pay much attention to the news as we do here in the think tank <laughs> sitting in Washington on Massachusetts Avenue. I will say, though, I, the thought did occur to me this morning as I was thinking of this election. Would it have been better for the Republican candidate to have said, Here's what we're doing about the issue, rather than simply blaming everything on Biden, which then allowed the Democratic candidate Suozzi to say, well, here's what I want to do on the issue, and you are stopping me from doing it. So I think you can run a hypothetical where if Republicans had passed the National Security Supplemental with the border reforms, they might be in a slightly better place politically. Obviously, they disagree with me, as they often do, and decided that they want to go into the election without addressing the border and attempting to pl- blame it all on Biden. We don't know whether that's going to be su- a successful strategy or not. And about Biden, there's more talk this week than there was three weeks ago that he might not run. What's your take on that? Well, I could see a scenario where he isn't on the ballot in November. I think he's likely to be on the ballot in November. I think he's going to be the nominee of the Democratic Party, absent a health episode. I think that his age is a major problem for him. And so when I look at politics today, the main question I have is, if Biden's unpopularity has not translated into Democratic failure, Right. Unquestionably, they, they've done better than expected, given the fact, but even though they mean, have a very weak does that standard mean bear. It, it won't translate into Biden's failure. And there I just don't know the answer, because when you look at some of these numbers, the low job approval, yeah. the terrible uh, ratings on the economy, on immigration, on the sense that the country and the world are out of control... The the sense of incompetence that voters have, the overwhelming majority of voters saying he just is not up to the job for another four years, it does really boggle the mind to sketch a scenario where he wins re-election. But we have this constant counterexample of Democrats overperforming. So that's why I've basically just given up prognostication and I've decided to live in the fantasy world where Glenn Youngkin is the president for the next five years. Okay, well, you stay there. But uh, now let's talk about the the turmoil on the right for a second. You are the historian of this issue and you've studied it carefully and you taught us that fights over isolationism versus a world engagement, fights over protectionism versus free trade, even fights over a sort of nativist sensibility versus a more openness to diversity, are long predated President Trump in the conservative world. And so I think you think that if Trump goes away, those battles will continue and to continue to sort of be the parameters of a sort of inner conservative debate. Mm -hmm. But depending on the time and period, one or the other of the two groups uh, pr- are prevailing. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's prevailing now? Well, I don't think anyone is except the Trump wing. So I think one can make a good argument that Donald Trump has impressed himself upon the Republican Party, really like no other leader that I can think of. In either party. He, he Maybe FDR. But Yeah, FDR would be the closest. And you think about the role he played in elevating the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, the role he played in changing the leadership of the RNC, that that's in progress. It is not an exaggeration to say that the Republican Party is the Trump party. It is him. It's his personality. And people who are in a good relationship with him 
tend to be elevated within the party. They can disagree on issues. But as long as they have a good relationship with Trump, they still have a place in the party. And I think that's an an important distinction to recognize, that as long as he's not angry at you for something you said about him, he will actually give some leeway for debates about issues. Trade or... or, Trade or or even foreign 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 policy, policy. you know? Yeah. So Trump is winning. Does that mean Trumpism is winning? I think it's still far too early to say. Congress is split. My main message now, as we're talking about these issues, is I think the Republican speaker owes it to the American people to allow the pro-Israel, pro-Ukraine majority a voice. If you think about the National Security Supplemental, which recently passed the Senate without any border reforms, that was by a vote of 70 to 29. Now, in politics, we talk about something called 70-30 issues. Those are the issues where you want to be with the 70%. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So this is a 70-30 issue. And we know that if they did allow a vote on this aid package on the House floor, it would pass overwhelmingly. And so it is, to me, the height of irony that self-described populists who are supposedly majoritarians would deny the majority its voice on this critical national security issue. All which is to say is it's not every Republican who's embraced a policy that we should stop aiding Ukraine, we shouldn't aid Israel unless we can find pay-fors elsewhere in the budget, and we should roll back the American presence in the world. Uh, it's it's a live debate that's happening. As you said that, I was reminded of, of Speaker Johnson's uh, opening remarks after he was chosen. And he was this surprise pick, and he was this nice guy from Louisiana who had deep religious faith, and he was funny and charming and warm. And he did commit to both sides. He was looking at Democrats and Republicans when he said this, is I'm going to allow votes to happen. I'm going to allow the will of the House I'm not going to run it like, you know, old speakers of the past. And we're going to learn a lot about what kind of person Speaker Johnson is in the next week, uh, I think. And I completely agree with you that the simplest thing is call a vote. Let's see how it goes. Um, and that's the right thing to do. Uh, OK, last question about Trump. I love your answer on Trump. That really helped me clear up some things because I, 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 I think you're right that his pr- – cult of personality is more powerful than the respective views of either side. Um, and But I want to take that a step further. His fascination with societies that are run with greater order, uh, China, <laughs> Russia, Orban, and his, you know, he, his desire to have things, the trains run on time, as you know, used to say about Mussolini. Do you do you have any concern about our institutional systems and checks and balances being able to stop him from doing things that are autocratic? I'm very concerned. I think in his first term, the guardrails held, but they were challenged most dramatically after he lost the 2020 election. And they were challenged in a way then that should not be repeated. And I do not want to see Trump in a position of authority again. You talk about his admiration of societies where, that are very orderly. That's not, I would say he just admires strongmen. Yeah. He just likes dictators. And in his mind, he is a dictator. And he would be one if he could be one. Fortunately, America lives in a constitutional republic, um, a constitutional republic under great stress, but one in which we still have the rule of law. And so I do think that if he were to return to the White House, he would challenge that again. And I think it would be a very messy process. I disagree with some of my colleagues who believe that a Trump dictatorship is fated for the United States of America. For one thing, he hasn't won yet. And he might not win re-election because of the issues that you and I opened this podcast with. But two, because Trump, in my view, is fundamentally a performer, things don't always go as planned. And there is a great distance between his stated intentions, and the practical results, right? And that's present in policy. You may have noticed the wall was not completed when he was president. Um, that's uh, in a, stated in terms of crisis management. Didn't exactly go well for him 
when the pandemic hit in 2020. Um, and that's also stated in his continued frustration with people who don't live up to his demands for 100 percent loyalty seven days a week. But but when Trump faces these difficulties, what we found in the first term is he doesn't keep pushing until the whole system breaks. He, in many cases, folded, right, when he was resisted by the courts or even by the Senate in some cases. Other times he seemed to get more enjoyment of kind of disparaging people online than actually retaliating against them in any meaningful way, in any nonverbal way. And so I expect that another Trump term would just be a lot of what we experienced during the first term, uh, but a little bit worse. And I don't think that it, we, the fundamental constitutional basis of this republic would be altered irrevocably. And our, just on the last one, I have a feeling you're of the of the group that says um, we don't want this resolved by the courts. We want this resolved by the people. That's right. I mean, I personally disagree with the interpretation of the 14th Amendment that says he's automatically disqualified. And I'm someone who supported. The no, but I mean, I do think I mean, I think that in a country where the rule of law operates, uh, someone who has to stand trial should stand trial. And we should follow correct criminal and civil procedure. So it's not out of the scope of my imagination that Donald Trump is convicted of a crime before Election Day. I do or that after election, if he becomes president, that the Supreme Court rules against him on some fundamental issue. That's true. If it's a policy issue, then the question will become, what does he do in response? And I think many of the people who are talking about the quote unquote Trump dictatorship assume that he would simply disobey the court's ruling. You know, the back and forth between the executive and the Supreme Court is long running issue in American history. The question is, will it be of a different quality under another Trump term or not? Or will it just be the same reality TV pro wrestling kayfabe insult comic that we've come to know uh, and uh, we've come to live with for the past eight years? Okay, with that, we're going to stop. There's a, a lot to talk about, the battle between the Supreme Court and the executive branch in the United States, but maybe we should save that for another podcast. Thanks very much, everybody. See you next time. Thank you.